Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us out there, cyberspace, whoever you are. Uh, you have joined a Google Hangout uh, hosted by Duke University and uh, also co-hosted by Boston University. We're joined today by two anthropologists who are part of a big international team. Uh, they have just in, in the last minute uh, gone public with a series of six papers in the journal Science, the April 12 edition of Science, which arrives tomorrow. Uh, in which they describe yet more features of a very intriguing pair of specimens from South Africa called Australopithecus sediba. Uh, the guy with the Duke background there is Stephen Churchill of Duke Evolutionary Anthropology. He led the team that analyzed the upper limb of uh, these specimens, sediba. And the guy with the blue background is Jeremy De Silva of Boston University, also an anthropologist. He led the team that analyzed the lower limb. So let's kind of start at the top, and then I want to work through with you guys what the news is in, the, in these papers that are appearing in science. Um, let's start with you, Steve. Uh, in, in a sentence or five, <laughs> what, what's the news in this latest batch about Sediba? We read two years ago that you had this interesting hand and that you think this creature is um, close to Homo but not quite there yet. What, what do you know in this latest batch? So the, the latest batch of papers represents um, sort of the culmination of our first pass through the skeleton. And we're, we're publishing now on parts of the skeleton which we were not able to, to tackle in the previous batch of papers. Uh, so we report on uh, the upper limb. The, the bullet there is that um, it looks remarkably well adapted for climbing and, and largely primitive. Uh, we report on the, um, the vertebral column. Uh, the interesting thing there is that, like us, Sediba appears to have uh, five lumbar vertebra, but a very mobile lower back, which we're tr still trying to make sense of. Uh, we report on the thorax. Um, the interesting there thing there is that Sediba has a very conical-shaped, uh, ape-like thorax, rather than the more cylindrical thorax that you see in modern humans. There is a paper on some uh, details of uh, dental anatomy, which uh, reinforce our interpretation that Sediba is closely related to our branch of the family tree. The we'll come family. back to that. That's To me, that's the yeah. key part here. Uh, there is a paper on uh, uh, a mandible, which we've been able to reconstruct. that was from, from several pieces, which uh, reinforces our interpretation that Sediba is a distinct species from its chronological predecessor in South Africa, Australopithecus africanus. And um, then there's also a very important paper on the lower limb, but I, I think I'd rather have um, Dr. De Silva uh, give you the praises on that. All right, let's go to the leg man. Jeremy, what can you tell us? Uh, the leg's extraordinary. Um, it doesn't look nearly as complete as the arm, um, but it preserves the key elements that you need to reconstruct bipedal locomotion. Uh, it has a heel, an ankle, a, a knee, a hip, and a lower back. Uh, and so we can reconstruct with great precision what this species was doing, and in particular what this individual was doing, the, the adult female. Uh, and what we concluded was that um, these things walk in a different kind of way than any early hominid we've ever seen before. Uh, and they walk in a different way than modern humans walk. And it struck me that there may be a couple different takeaways from that, one of which would be that it is possible that bipedalism happened more than once. It's possible. Um, there, there are multiple ways you can interpret this. Um, okay. The last common ancestor could have had some degree of bipedal locomotion. It's part of, part of its repertoire, its locomotor repertoire. And from that ancestor, you could have multiple uh, versions of bipedalism evolving. Uh, it's also possible that, the, uh, that more recently in Australopithecus, as the Australopithecus a uh, group of animals um, experienced an adaptive radiation and filled different niches that you had uh, different uh, uh, forms of locomotion in these different species, uh, some becoming more tree-dwelling than others, and uh, that's going to impact how you walk on two legs. If you begin to acquire adaptations or retain adaptations for tree climbing, um, it's going to come in a certain uh, uh, manner at the expense of, of the kind of bipedal locomotion that humans yeah. Yes. So, as I understand it, Sediba is still a quite accomplished tree climber. We know the arm is set up for that, the um, sort of trapezoidal torso, 
uh, the middle of the foot is flexible, which I would prefer if I were climbing trees. And yet, they're in an environment where there's starting to be some advantage to bipedalism. They have to cover a lot of ground, or what? The trees are far apart. What? Why are they standing up? Do you think? Well, those are all good questions and things that I think we're going to need to look into in a lot more detail. Um, understanding the environment these things are living in is going to be crucial to really understanding um, how they were utilizing that environment. Um, but it seems to me that that you can go back a lot further than Sidiba. Sidiba is living at two million years. You go back three million years, three and a half million years, and there's both skeletal evidence and footprint evidence that bipedalism had evolved. And not only that, but it's a it's a, a, a in many ways, I, I interpret the data at least to suggest a, a very human-like form of bipedalism. Not exactly like humans today, uh, but human-like. And so I expected at the very least to see a similar form of bipedal locomotion in this particular species, um, yeah, yeah. And, and I didn't. I see so three and a half million years ago, you're talking about East Africa, you're talking about afarensis, what we call Lucy. That's in right. common parlance, right? right. And, yep. and the bipedalism there, you say, is, is more like modern humans? In some ways. In some ways. Certainly, for instance, the heel is very human-like and would suggest that, uh, and we have footprints that show that these things were engaging in heel-striking bipedalism. And in Sidiba, the heel is, is strikingly chimpanzee-like, which began this path of, well, therefore, it's, it's probably not heel-striking in the same manner that humans do today, or that even Australopithecus of their species of Australopithecus were doing. So it must have been walking in a different kind of way. Okay. Uh, how tall is Sidiba, by the way? Well, our best estimates are, are that um, uh, they're somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1.3 meters, maybe four, four and a half feet tall. Okay. Fairly small bodied, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's sort of chimpanzee range? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, we did a little bit of upper limb, we did a little bit of lower limb. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the spine. You, you mentioned it in passing, Steve. What's, what, have, what have you seen in the spine in this set of papers? Yeah, so there's been an interesting question for a while about how many lumbar vertebra the Australopiths uh, had, species like Australopithecus afarensis, which includes the very famous Lucy. And uh, there are some people who have um, uh, held for a long time that they had six lumbar vertebra, and most modern humans humans have five. You occasionally find individuals who have six, but mm -hmm. most people have five. Uh, chimpanzees and gorillas, on the other hand, have four. Uh, they have a very short, uh, stiff, largely inflexible back, which helps them with, with uh, the kind of climbing, the way that they, they climb. So uh, this is something we've been trying to sort out, and the evidence from Sediba strongly suggests that there are five lumbar vertebra. If you um, if you define lumbar vertebra as the ones that don't have ribs. Uh, but that the last vertebra that has a rib, the 12th thoracic vertebra, mm -hmm. has got um, joints that connect it to the vertebra above it that look like a lumbar vertebra. Did you bring some of those pieces today? Uh, I did. Unfortunately, the specimens are, um, are locked in, um, in matrix. Okay. And they're so closely uh, locked together in matrix that we're unable to, per to prepare them out. So uh, what we do is we um, do very fine CT scans and then make good copy, good quality um, uh, 3D printouts of them. Unfortunately, I don't have copies of the 3D printouts. But uh, these are the last two thoracic vertebra of Sediba, uh, okay. the 11th and 12th. Uh, we can tell that they bear ribs because they've got the little marks where the ribs attach. And we can see, oops, we can see in this uh, 12th vertebra here that it has a joint very much like a lumbar vertebra, which means that it's a bit more flexible than the other thoracic vertebra. And this tells us that Sediba had a functionally very long lower back and a very flexible lower back and was probably able to create a greater curvature to the lower back than most people today can. Is that a walking back or a climbing back? Well, we see very flexible back in monkeys that jump from branch to branch. Uh, we don't really think that this is what Sediba is doing. Uh, you know, Sediba is a, a bit large to do that kind of thing. Uh, but it may be that um, having a very flexible lower back was an important part of the, the kind of gait that Sediba was employing when it walked on two legs. 
Yeah, country. most most of the the large climbing apes, like chimpanzees, gorillas, and, and orangutans, as, as Steve mentioned, have these rigid, stiff lower backs. Um, and so, seeing a long, flexible spine in Sediba, combined with anatomies in the foot and the arm that suggest it was still climbing, tells us that it wasn't climbing like any modern chimpanzee was climbing. It was climbing in a in a biomechanically different kind of way. Uh, it would climb more like like you and I would climb. Uh, would attempt to climb a tree, um, but with the with the lower back, um, uh, as Steve was referring to the to the curvature. Ah, you've got it. There you go. Well, this is this is the these are the, now the last two lumbar vertebra, and they produce this tremendous um, lordosis or uh, the small of the back uh, is this uh, sort of curvature in the 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 last two lumbars, and that helps align uh, the torso above the hip joint and is an important bipedal adaptation. But one of the neat things about Sediba, uh, there are many neat things, but one of them is that uh, it has extreme lordosis. It appears to have hyperlordosis, which is exactly what we uh, predicted would be found uh, based on the reconstruction of, of walking uh, that, that, that we predict. So what we uh, have proposed is that this is a what's called a hyperpronator, that when it walks, it's going to twist the inside of its foot inwards, uh, which is going to uh, cause the knee to rotate and the hip to rotate and the whole torso to pitch forward. And we know this because in humans today who walk this way, uh, they can suffer lower back problems because their torso pitches forward over their hips. Interesting. And, and an adaptation to deal with that, if you're adapted to walk this way, would be enhanced lumbar curvature, uh, and we see that in in this particular specimen. So the toes are pointed kind of inward. Uh, the weight is going around the outside of the foot. Yeah, you, the the toe orientation we're actually not sure about right now, and that can vary enormously from one individual to the next. Okay. Uh, but based on the the anatomy of the heel, especially, it appears as though Sediba is landing, is contacting its foot. I've got a foot here. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, it's contacting on the on the outside. I'm sorry, on the outside. Back up a little bit. Of its That's foot. not Sadiba's foot, by the way. No, 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 no. <laughs> so hopefully, it'll be this complete at some point. But looks like Michael Phelps's foot. Where'd you get that thing? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just the the camera. But if you land, if you land on the outside of your foot, the ground is going to push back on the foot and roll it inwards towards the big toe, and that sets off this chain reaction, where it's not just the foot rolling in but the knee begins to roll in as well and so does the hip. Uh, and we see uh, anatomies that in isolation look odd in the foot and in the knee and in the hip and in the back, but together they actually form this really um, internally consistent picture of an animal that's adapted for walking with this uh, rotational hyperpronating gait. Part, part of the story that strikes me about Sadiba is that these specimens you have are just so incredibly complete. Um, the work that Steve Churchill's been doing is everything from the fingertips up to the collarbone and, and the shoulder blade. It's just amazing. Yeah, that it, gives you a lot of data. You're not having to guess about some things you can actually measure. It's remarkable. Uh, one thing that has plagued our attempts to understand the evolution of body shape you know, limb proportions. How long are the upper limbs relative to the lower limbs? That's actually an important thing to know because yeah. it tells us a lot about uh, the way that they're locomoting and the, the kinematics and um, the, the gait parameters. And this kind of research has been plagued by the fact that the fossil record is, is fragmentary. So you, you rarely get a complete uh, limb bone. You know, you often find something like this, just a partial uh, this is the, the humerus or upper arm bone, and you find a partial one, and then you have to estimate the, the rest of it to begin to figure out what the proportions are. And in Sediba, we have complete bones, okay? Her, her uh, humerus is a bit um, uh, broken, and it required a little bit of reconstruction, but the whole thing is there. We have a, a complete clavicle or collarbone, a complete, largely complete scapula, complete humerus, uh, complete forearm bones, radius and ulna, and most of the hand skeleton. So we can say without error what the length of these bones are and what the relationship of one bone to another is in terms of its anatomy. And, uh, it's remarkable. Um, we're about halfway through the half hour that we allotted to ourselves, so let's turn our attention to the mandible and to the teeth because those papers seem to be the ones that are making the most 
uh, bold claim. Neither of you have sort of alluded to it yet, but there's a pretty bold claim, particularly in the tooth paper, which was led by a gentleman at Liverpool. Yeah, so um, uh, neither Jeremy nor I were authors on the, the tooth paper, but we'll do our best to, okay. to, to represent. Well, we can start with the mandible if you're more comfortable there. Uh, no, that's, that's okay. The tooth paper uh, looks at some very fine aspects of, uh, of tooth morphology, the size and shape of cusps, and we know that those things are highly heritable. They, they tend to really signal the underlying genetics um, of dental development. They, they're not features which change a lot because of environmental influences during growth and development. So we, we um, trust them to be fairly good indicators of, of uh, the genetics of these organisms. And uh, our analysis, or I should say uh, Joel Irish and his team's analysis of these dental traits uh, shows that uh, Sediba clusters very closely with Australopithecus africanus. We believe that Sediba evolved from africanus. Although and africanus is another South African. It is a South African form that was around from about 3 million to 2 million years ago. And okay. of course Sediba is, is right on the other side of 2 million at about 1.98 million. Okay. So Sediba forms a nice tight cluster with Africanus, and then they form a branch with uh, specimens of Homo, Homo habilis, uh, Homo erectus, Homo rudolfensis, which supports our interpretation that Sediba is, is closely related to our branch of the family tree. And they're closer to uh, our branch of the family tree than is Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis. And that suggests that perhaps um, the origins of our genus, the genus Homo, wasn't an East African-centered event, as most people believe, but perhaps happened in the southern part of the continent. Okay. That, that's the uh, line I was hoping to elicit from one or both of you. Yeah. Jeremy, you look puzzled or concerned. <laughs> well, the, the family tree aspect of, of, um, uh, of not only this find, but... Um, all of the finds in the last decade, in my opinion, um, have complicated the family tree enormously. And, uh, uh, you know, re reconstructing who's related to whom is not, is not easy business, um, especially since we have good evidence now that um, there were what we call uh, uh, parallelisms or convergent evolutionary events where different lineages uh, evolved similar anatomies. And, um, with Sediba, we, we, we have that dilemma that no matter how you slice it, no matter where it fits on the family tree, um, it's showing us that uh, anatomies have um, evolved independently. For instance, uh, if Sediba is an ancestor to genus Homo, uh, then Afarensis would have evolved a human-like heel independently, and some of the bipedal adaptations would have happened independently uh, in that lineage. If Sediba, if Sediba is not an ancestor, uh, then we have to explain how the teeth, hand, and pelvis evolved human-like anatomies. So no matter where you put it, um, it shows us that convergence occurred, uh, which makes us like every other mammal out there. That's how evolution works. That's yeah, what you would expect yeah. to find. Exactly. But now we have good evidence of it. I think before yeah. it was difficult to say that with certainty, and now I, th I think we can. Well, unfortunately, you know, two data points form a line but it might not actually be a line once you get all the data points that go between those two, right? That's right. Um, and I would, I would add to this as well that I think in addition to, to uh, seeing how this connects to HOMO, I think it has really important implications for what's going on further back in time. That if, if Africanus and Sediba don't descend from Afarensis, um, they instead share a common ancestor further back in time. And as we go further back in time, we don't have as many fossils. And we don't necessarily know what those things uh, looked like and how they moved. And as you go back in time, what, you don't have to go that far uh, back in time. And you now l end up with an early Australopithecus, like Anamensis, uh, or even further back, and you get Ramidus. You get Artipithecus Ramidus, which is a very primitive body plan. Uh, and it leads to this interesting possibility of, of bipedalism uh, evolving in different kinds of ways in these different lineages in different places. That's right. Mm -hmm. The distance from South Africa to East Africa is not insignificant for something walking the hard way. 
Yeah, and it'd be nice to have some fossils from some in-between localities as well. Yeah. Uh, which we, we don't have much. No. Okay, um, anything in the Mandible paper that uh, jumps out at you that we need to be aware of? Well, the main point of the Mandible paper is that uh, it, it really shows Sediva to be something different from uh, Australopithecus africanus. When uh, we announced the species in 2010, some of our colleagues were quick to point out that uh, we perhaps had not taken variation in Australopithecus africanus into sufficient account, and that Sediva might just be a late sort of uh, a late remnant of Australopithecus, Australopithecus right. africanus and not something different. Uh, the, the Mandible paper, I think, pretty strongly makes the case that it really is something that is um, uh, morphologically, anatomically different from africanus and deserves to be called its own species. Okay. Um, let's cast forward a little bit then. These um, two specimens that you're writing about, MH1 and MH2 by name, come from a place called the Malapa Cave. Uh, and as I understand it, there is quite a bit more uh, promising looking matrix there. There's quite a bit more to be found. What else are you going to be looking for going forward from this point? Well, the amazing thing about the Malapa site is that we haven't excavated there yet. All of these fossils are coming from blocks of sediment which were disturbed by miners who blasted at the cave uh, about a hundred years ago. Uh, it looks like they only put in two uh, drill holes and set off two charges. We're not entirely sure. It doesn't look like they actually mined the cave. We think that perhaps they were uh, uh, getting sediment out of the cave to build up a roadbed. So all we've done is we've taken those blocks of sediment and x-rayed them and prepared them out and, and we're extracting fossils from them. And there are more to come. We've found a block recently which has got what we believe to be uh, the better part of the lower limb of MH1. It'll take a long time to prepare it out because it's very arduous, but uh, that, that will be very exciting because we, now we'll be able to see perhaps some complete bones of, uh, of the juvenile specimen for the lower limb. And Jeremy will get another paper out of it. Yeah, <laughs> we, we like to keep Jeremy busy. Uh, so we um, ha have been busy building infrastructure at the site and getting it ready for excavation, and we can actually see some human fossils still in the wall of the cave. So we know that there's more <laughs> to be recovered, and we still have more blocks to work through. So we're quite hopeful that we'll we'll complete, you know, we'll flesh out the um, the the two main skeletons and that we'll find some more of some of the other individuals who are represented uh, at the moment only by a few pieces. And, and is everything there roughly the same age, or do you have strata that are going to go back further? We have uh, what appear to be two separate depositional events at the cave. Most of the material is coming from a single event which was centered on 1.98 million, and then uh, that those deposits are separated by a thin flow stone. So we know that it has to be a different depositional event, and there are more deposits on top of the flow stone. But they're very close in age to the deposits underneath. So two different events, but geologically very close in age. That's going to be very interesting for many years to come. Uh, what other show and tell did you bring, Jeremy? I saw you had an interesting hand. Oh, yeah. Well, um, as Steve mentioned at the very beginning, these papers are a culmination of, of work that's gone on for the last five years. Yeah. Uh, first was the announcement of this as a, as a new species in 2010, uh, and, and roughly 18 months later was um, the description of a number of pieces of anatomy uh, uh, from the, the, well, the brain of, of the individual. Um, and, and the hand and the pelvis, which Steve worked on, uh, this, uh, this is the hand, um, and, and we, you know, we don't find this. <laughs> this, is, this is incredible to have, to have a, a, an almost complete hand of an early hominid, um, and, and I'm certainly hoping that we'll have a foot equivalent of this soon. That'd be great. Uh, but, but, you know, to connect with what you're asking about the completeness of these, um, we don't have an opportunity to work with complete specimens very often, and so as researchers, we specialize in particular areas of the body, um, and we publish papers on the isolated 
foot bone that gets found in some deposit. Um, and to have um, pieces of, of most of the major pieces of the skeleton represented um, is, it, it, frankly, it's a tad overwhelming. It's, a, it's amazing. Um, and with the lower limb, at least, uh, what it prompted me to do um, and what really, I think, moved our paper forward um, was I worked with a physical therapist. Uh, and his name is Kenneth Holt uh, at BU, and he is trained to understand how the different lower limb systems are integrated. Uh, and and he was a, a, a you know huge part of of us developing our locomotor hypothesis. Um, so with such complete finds, we're going to be uh, we're going to be forced to think uh, in a slightly different way and to work with folks who are trained to think. Uh, as uh, the human skeleton as, a, as an integrated system, hmm. which is great. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're just about at the time where I think we ought to perhaps roll some credits. Um, we haven't mentioned uh, the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, which is sort of the base of operations for this. The Malapa Cave is less than an hour away from campus, as I understand it. That's correct. Um, and you, I know Steve has a, a dual appointment there. Do you as well, Jeremy? Yes. Okay. And and how has this work been funded? Um, where does the money come from to allow you to do field research and to, to do your so research and publish the papers? We have a, a variety of uh, funding sources. We've been well supported by the government of South Africa, both the provincial government of the province of Hautang and the national government of South Africa. And the University of the Witwatersrand has provided us a lot of financial support and material support. Uh, they've been absolutely great to us. And then we've, we've had uh, uh, generous funding from National Geographic and other uh, uh, funding institutions and uh, good private donors as well. So we've been, we've been very fortunate. Great. And Jerry, any other funding sources for you? Yeah, um, members of the research teams uh, individually, and certainly I, c I can say this myself, have been funded by the National Science Foundation to some degree. Um, the Leakey Foundation as well uh, has funded aspects of, of people's work. Uh, and then our individual universities, I think, have been very supportive. Uh, Boston University, in my case, uh, uh, providing uh, support for this kind of research. Terrific. OK. When can we expect to see the next wave of papers? You guys are on kind of a regular rhythm at this point. I don't know. I'm, I'm starting to burn out a little bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. That gets us to just about a half hour. Uh, anything else we didn't allude to that you'd like to get in? I don't think so. Uh, okay, great. My parting word would be, what, a, what an absolutely phenomenal example of, of evolution. Uh, Chimp-like in some ways, ape-like in some ways, human-like in other ways, and what a beautiful transitional animal. It's spectacular. Yeah, yeah. We look forward to learning more about them. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.